God the Father, God Almighty, by whose plan shall we stand as we sing together? with them a covenant. I will be your God and you will be my people. In that relationship they were to be freed from sin and become a blessing to all. Then God came to us in Jesus Christ and fulfilled that covenant for all people. Through Christ's life, death, and resurrection, God made for us a new covenant of grace. We come before you Our Lord Jesus Christ instituted baptism as the visible means of entry into the new covenant. Baptism is a gift of God. In this sacrament, through grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, we are united with Christ, are cleansed by His saving work, enter into the fellowship of the church, and are called to a life of faith and willing obedience. Claimed by God in baptism, we pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, our lives may faithfully affirm the blessings of Christ's new covenant. Ina, as you present yourself before God and this congregation, we call upon you to profess your faith. Do you believe in God as your Creator and loving Heavenly Father, in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, and in the Holy Spirit as your comforter and sustainer 
according to the Holy Scriptures. Lord, make us one with all your children as we profess our faith, saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation. Ina, do you in this faith turn away from sin, evil, and selfishness in your thoughts, words, and actions? And do you intend to participate actively in Christ's church, serving God all the days of your life? Let's turn to the reaffirmation of faith, which is found on page 173. Ina, you have affirmed your faith and baptismal covenant before God and this congregation and by the grace and strength of Christ have declared your desire and promise to renew your Christian discipleship. We welcome you today with joy and thanksgiving. May the Lord be with you. Build yourself up on your most holy faith, led by the Holy Spirit. Keep yourself by grace and the love of God as you wait for our Lord Jesus Christ in His mercy to give you eternal life. And as we sing the hymn of reception on page 174, I would invite the members of our joint board to come and extend to Ina the right hand of fellowship. Continue our worship, receiving our morning offering, remembering Paul's words, let us do good unto all, but especially unto those who are of the household of faith.
Gracious God, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who came into the world to be a servant and to give his life as a ransom for us all. May we follow his example of humble servanthood, giving ourselves to others, sharing all that we have and all that we are, so that your kingdom might come to the hearts of people everywhere. So use us and use these gifts, we pray, for we offer them in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Our epistle lesson for today comes from James chapter 3, verses 13 through chapter 4, verse 8. Two kinds of wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good deeds, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and be not false to the truth truth. This wisdom is not such as comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, without uncertainty or insincerity. And the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Friendship with the world. What causes wars? What causes fightings among you? Is it not your passions that are at war in your members? You desire and do not have, so you kill. And you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel lesson comes from Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. Jesus again foretells his death and resurrection. They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he would not have anyone know it. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him, Who is the greatest? And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all, and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. I'd like to invite the children to join me for just a few minutes up front. I don't think we have anybody today. They're all at Laurel Ridge for family weekend. 
I can do a children's sermon for you all if you'd like it. <laughs> I'll invite you to turn to page 117, and we'll join in the intercessions for a time of crisis as we continue to remember those in eastern North Carolina who are suffering as a result of Hurricane Florence. We continue to hear reports of so many people who are facing dire circumstances, and we certainly want to pray for them and do all that we can to offer support. So let's pray together these petitions on 117. God of mercy and God of comfort, we come before you in this time of difficulty, mindful of human frailty and need, confused and struggling to find meaning in the face of suffering. We are grateful that even as we share in the joy of Christ Jesus, we can also share abundantly in comfort in the midst of suffering. For victims of fire or flood, storm or earthquake, famine or disease, for those whom disaster has left homeless, injured, or bereaved, for refugees and those separated from loved ones, for all who are in danger, trouble, or anguish, we ask the presence and strength of your Spirit. Give all who suffer the love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. We know that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because your love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Be the support of all who give their strength, their skill, and their stamina in a ministry of mercy. Open our hearts in generosity that we may be partners in their commitment to bring relief. Where tempers flare and a partisan spirit provokes new hostility, raise up people who have patience and restraint. Where indifference allows crisis to deepen and suffering to go without relief, awaken deliverers who have zeal and strength. We pray for those who are engaged in making important decisions in this time, for those who report on these events, and for those who shape public opinion. Give them the courage to speak out and the restraint to listen, that together we may discern the truth and hold aloft its light. Take away the temptation to trust in human power and military solutions and give us the courage to be your servants to the community of nations. Direct all governments in the way of peace and justice that your will may be known and done among the nations. Deliver us from the sins which lead to war and conflict and strengthen within us the will to establish righteousness and justice on the earth. We pray for those who are suffering and can make no sense of tragedy. Help them to turn to the one who embraces us in our lives, even Jesus Christ, who lived and suffered among us. There is no one who is righteous, not even one, for we have all turned away from you. Make us aware of our common need of a Savior, and remove from our hearts the pride, ambition, and greed that would lead us to enslave and demean other people. Have mercy on your whole creation. Hasten the day when the kingdom of the world shall become your kingdom, and by grace make us worthy to stand before you. Amen. Let us join in our hymn of preparation as an insert in your bulletin, Will You Let Me Be Your Servant?
us pray together. Gracious God, let us learn from the example of your Son, Jesus Christ, the call to servanthood, and to find our greatness by our willingness to serve others. And now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, because you are indeed our strength, our rock, our fortress. Amen. I once heard the story of a pastor who served a small church that was beginning to grow. And he made a comment to a parishioner that it was wonderful to see 60 or 70 people in worship when they had had about 35. And the parishioner responded that she had taken attendance every week and that according to her count, there were only 45 in church. And she was as adamant about her count as the pastor was about his. So they both agreed that the following week they would count the number of people in worship and then they would meet after church and they would compare numbers. Well, after worship, that next week they met, and again, their numbers did not match. So they began to talk about all the people that were in worship that day, and the pastor began by counting eight for the family in the front pew. He said there were two adults and there were six children. And before he could name anyone else, the woman stopped him. You can't count the children. And he was so shocked by her remark that he jokingly said, Well, Margaret, if it's living and breathing and walks into the sanctuary during worship, I'm going to count it. <laughs> and Margaret responded, No, Pastor, you cannot count the children because they don't contribute. As they counted the following Sundays, the pastor noticed that the number of children dwindled. And one year after their first argument about attendance figures, there was one child in church on a certain Sunday, and the woman made a comment that they should now be able to agree on their count. The pastor agreed that Margaret was right, but he was sorry to see that all the children had gone to another church where they counted. In today's gospel reading, Jesus has just revealed his true mission to the disciples. And he tells them, as Nola pointed out to us last week, that he was not going to be this military Messiah that Israel had longed for. Rather, he was going to be a servant Messiah, one who would be despised and rejected, who would be betrayed and then delivered into the hands of those who would kill him, but he promised that on the third day he would rise again. The disciples um, didn't think that Jesus had heard their discussion on the trip back home because they had argued about who would be the greatest among them when Jesus came into this earthly power because they still had it in their minds that Jesus was going to be this great messianic king who would establish himself politically on the throne of Israel and would send the invading Romans away. Now when they get back to Capernaum, Jesus confronts the disciples because little do they know that he's overheard their conversation on the road and so he asked them, what were you discussing on the road? And like kids who had had their hands caught in the cookie jar, the disciples are sort of startled and they say nothing. Mark says they were silent, that they made absolutely no response to what Jesus has said to them. Maybe they're a little ashamed or maybe they're embarrassed that Jesus, who is the great servant, had heard them arguing over position. One author says this about their conversation. Repeatedly, Jesus has told them what awaited him in Jerusalem. Yet they're still thinking of his kingdom in earthly terms. 
and of themselves as the chief ministers of state underneath him. There's something heartbreaking in the thought of Jesus going toward a cross and his disciples arguing among themselves about who was going to be the greatest. Now in his great wisdom, Jesus knows that this is a teachable moment. And in his day, if a teacher wanted to say anything really important, they would sit down and then they would call all their students around them. And that's what Mark says. As the disciples gather about Jesus, he says to them, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Or as another translation says it, so you want to be first. First, and have first place, then take the last place. Be a servant to everyone. Now the word that Jesus uses from the Greek language in this passage is diakonos, which is literally translated in English, slave. So in New Testament times, a diakonos would spend their entire day taking care of others, washing feet from the dusty roads when people came in, waiting tables, doing chores that others would consider far too lowly. So what Jesus is saying to his disciples is simply this, do you want to be great in my kingdom? If you do, then you must be a servant who freely attends to the needs of others without expecting anything in return. The opposite of this servant attitude, which Jesus has sensed earlier in the disciples' discussion on the road, is to seek honor, to seek respect, to seek position, but to not serve others. This is one of those hard sayings of Jesus, even for us listeners today. Because it's rather easy to look at the disciples in this story and wonder how in the world could they be so selfish as to think about their own positions of honor and privilege when Jesus is talking about his death. But brothers and sisters, it still happens. How often do we make the pretense of serving Jesus when what we really want is recognition? Or maybe prestige? How often do we do something for Christ in the life of the church and in the community and find ourselves resentful when no one acknowledges or tells us how wonderful we are? You see, to take the servant role, to truly be like Jesus Christ is to serve not because we want recognition, but to serve in order that we might serve the one who served us by giving up His very life for us. As He most often does, Jesus uses an object lesson to demonstrate this truth because there must have been a child nearby as He was teaching in the house. And so He calls the child to Him and He takes the child, Mark says, in His arms and says to those who are listening, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So what Jesus is saying is true greatness involves being a servant. Caring about people like children who at that time were really considered insignificant. The disciples had been rather childish, hadn't they? Walking back to Capernaum, arguing about who was the greatest. But instead of being childish, Jesus wants them to be childlike in their attitude by displaying a willingness to serve as humbly as a child would. I love the way one pastor describes that scene. He says... By taking a child in his arms, Jesus is showing what true greatness is. It's not acting like children in the sense of arguing about who is the greatest, 
No, true greatness is welcoming people like children. Those society sees as insignificant. Now, as you can well imagine, this was very radical teaching in Jesus' day because children were often seen as property. They were sort of like second-class citizens who could easily be discarded. Remember that story I shared about the woman who did not count the children in worship attendance because they didn't contribute? The disciples were sort of like that in their attitude, thinking they were more important, vying for positions of power and authority instead of valuing the childlike attitude of a servant. I think we have to admit this morning that, like the disciples... We all want to feel valued. We want to know that we matter. There's nothing wrong with that. To know that our lives mean something, that we're making some kind of contribution. But according to Jesus, our greatness, our significance in the kingdom of God is not about position. It's not about the accolades of other people. It's not even about our personal honor. Our greatness is determined by our childlike willingness to serve wherever we are called. Do you remember that story that Jesus tells about a servant who comes in from working in the field all day long? And that servant is not invited to sit at the table with his master. Instead, that servant is expected to serve his master. And Jesus concludes the story by saying this, Does the master thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So also, when you have done all that is commanded of you, say, we are unworthy servants, we have only done what was our duty. The first 20 years of the ministry of the late Mother Teresa of Calcutta went unnoticed until 1969 when Malcolm Mulgaridge of the BBC interviewed her and a film and a book entitled Something Beautiful for God followed that interview. And as you can imagine, soon Mother Teresa was on her way to becoming this great international celebrity Special recognition came from Queen Elizabeth in England and from the United States Congress, even from Harvard University, which granted her an honorary doctorate. In 1979, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for her work among the poor of India. Yet Mother Teresa was never comfortable with the limelight. She said, for me, the limelight is more difficult than bathing a leper. On the road to Capernaum that day, the disciples certainly didn't view bathing a leper or receiving people like children as true signs of greatness. And yet, that's most like Jesus, isn't it? To turn the values of the world totally upside down. To teach us that the highest place is the lowest. To teach us that the most prestigious place in His kingdom will be serving. Not in the best position up front, but often behind, giving others first place instead. And you know this teaching was not just something Jesus Christ talked about, it's something He lived. Philippians says that even though He was in the very form of God, had all the power of the world at His disposal, He never used that power for His own selfish purposes. He chose instead to give Himself for the life of the world as a servant obedient even unto his death. Do we want to be great? 
then we have to learn to be last. Do we want to be great? Then we have to learn to serve. Do we want to be great? Then we have to expend our efforts to exalt the name of Jesus Christ rather than our own name. Do we want to be great? And we have to receive people in our life who are as innocent and as disregarded as children. The legend of the great fisher king tells us how as a boy the fisher king had his courage tested. He was sent out to spend the night alone in the dark forest And during the night while he was sleeping, he had a dream of the Holy Grail, the cup that had been used by Christ during the Last Supper. And although it was surrounded by great flames of fire, the fisher king knew that great wealth and glory would be his if he could only claim that sacred cup And he reached out in his vision into the flames to grab the Holy Grail, but he couldn't take it. All he got for his efforts were severe burns on his hand and a lasting wound. As the years went by, the Fisher King became very despondent and alone, and his wound grew deeper. One day he went for a walk in the forest where he came upon a court jester. Are you all right, the jester asked. Is there anything that I can do for you? Yes, the fisher king said, you could give me a drink because I'm very thirsty. And so the jester king took this old dilapidated cup from his bag and he filled it with water from a nearby stream and he gave it to the fisher king, and as the fisher king drank, his wound began to heal. And when he looked more closely, he saw the source of his healing, for the cup from which he drank had turned into the Holy Grail. What wonderful magic do you possess, the fisher king asked the jester, and the jester just sort of shrugged, and he said, I don't know any magic. All I did was get a drink for a thirsty soul. The story of the Fisher King reminds us that when we seek things for selfish purposes, it wounds our spirit. But when we love and we become servants, We can be a source through which God reaches out and He heals the world. Then and only then will we learn true greatness. Let us pray. Teach us, Lord, that no matter what the task When that task is done for you, it is holy. And it makes us great because we are joining you in your service to the world. The world today so often needs people who will stop and listen and care and be about others before themselves. Help us to be that kind of people that others may see the Lord Jesus Christ even in us. Amen. Shall we stand as we sing?
the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you forevermore.